Good morning and welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Bill Benson. I am the host of the museum's public program, First Person. Thank you for joining us today. We are in our 17th year of the First Person program, and our first person today is Mr. Peter Garag, whom we shall meet shortly. This 2016 season of First Person is made possible by the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. We are grateful for their sponsorship, and I'm pleased to let you know that Mr. Lewis Smith is here with us today. First Person is a series of conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their first-hand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as volunteers here at this museum. Our program will continue through mid-August. Uh, we end uh, mid right smack dab in the middle of the month. Um, we hope that you can join us at uh, another time, and our museum's website provides information about each of our upcoming First Person guests. The address is www.ushmm.org, and it's also listed in your program. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card that you will find in your program or speak with a museum representative at the back of the theater. In doing so, you will receive an electronic copy of Peter Garag's biography so that you can remember and share his testimony after you leave here today. Peter will share with us his first person account of his experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor for about 45 minutes or so. Um, if we have time toward the end of our program, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask Peter a few questions. The life stories of Holocaust survivors transcend the decades. What you are about to hear from Peter is one individual's account of a Holocaust. Peter Garag was born into a Jewish family in Budapest the capital of Hungary in March 1941 as Peter Grunwald. He changed his family name in 1962 to Grog. The arrow on this map of Europe points to Hungary. On this next map, the arrow points to Budapest. Peter's father, Arpad Grunwald, worked as an office manager at a publishing house while his mother, Olga Schoenfeld, worked as a hat maker and raised Peter. This was the last picture of the family together. Peter was three months old. Peter's father was conscripted to work in the Hungarian Forced Labor Battalion beginning in 1940 because as a Jew he was considered undesirable for armed service by the Hungarian government. Here is a photo of the Forced Labor Battalion. The arrow to the uh, top left side of your screen points to Peter's father, Arpad. In 1942, Arpad was sent to Ukraine to work with a labor battalion and he died in Ukraine. Peter and his mother remained in Budapest during this time. In March 1944, German forces invaded Hungary. Peter and his mother were evicted from their apartment and went into hiding with a Christian family. A few days later, a neighbor denounced them. The Hungarian gendarmerie, or police, arrested Peter's mother and put her in a jail. This is an historical photograph from October 1944 of Jewish women in Budapest arrested by Hungarian police. Two days after her arrest, Peter's mother escaped and she and Peter moved into an apartment safeguarded by Swedish diplomat Raoul Wallenberg. Later, they fled to the Budapest ghetto where they lived with some of Peter's other relatives until the end of the war. In January 1945, Budapest was liberated by the Soviet army. In 1946, Peter's mother made plans for them to emigrate to the United States. This picture is from their passport. In 1949, while they were waiting for their visa, the communist government of Hungary closed the borders. Peter grew up in Hungary. In 1980, Peter defected to the United States. He worked for more than 30 years at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And here you see Peter just before his retirement from NASA, hard at work sending off a satellite somewhere. Although Peter's mother had attempted to emigrate to the United States after the war, they were unable to leave and lived under the communist government until Peter's defection in 1980. While in Hungary, Peter was eventually able to attend university and he earned a master's degree in electrical engineering. He was part of the team that built the first computer designed completely by Hungarians. His education and experience made it possible for Peter to remain and work in the United States following his defection until he received his green card and later became a United States citizen. 
Peter, who retired in 2014, spent 34 years in the computer field in the U.S., spending most of his time at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, where he worked on such major projects as Landsat, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Space Shuttle, and the James Webb Telescope, which is to be launched in 2018. Following his retirement, Peter became more actively involved with this museum and began volunteering here. He translates documents written in Hungarian and video testimonies of Holocaust survivors and eyewitnesses. In February, Peter graduated from a five-month docent training course and became a tour guide for the museum's permanent exhibit. Since then, he has been leading tours for U.S. law enforcement groups and students from many states. He describes his work as very emotional. Peter and his wife, Georgie, live in Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. They have four daughters, Sarah, Laura, Anna, and Alana. They lost their daughter, Juliana, when she was just two years old. Peter's daughter, Veronica, from his earlier marriage in Hungary, lives in northern Virginia with her husband and her two daughters, Monica, age eight, and Catalina, age seven. They are a very close-knit family, and I'm pleased to let you know that today, Peter is accompanied by his wife, Georgie, their daughter, Alana, and father-in-law, John Walker, and they're sitting uh, right here in front of us. Um, after his first person, after his first first person program last year, Peter is now beginning to speak publicly about his Holocaust experience. He's been sharing his family's history with military, high school, and college groups. And with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming our first person, Mr. Peter Grog. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today and, and for your willingness to, to spend an hour with us, which is too short of a time to, to cover all that you could tell us, but we'll, we'll try to get through as much of it as we can. World War II began when Germany and Russia invaded Poland in September 1939. Before you tell us about what happened to you and your family during the war and the Holocaust, tell us first a little bit about your family, your community, and your life prior to the war beginning, and not yours because you, you came a little bit later, but um, tell us what you can about your family. <coughs> a little bit of uh, context. I will not go back to 2,000 years of Jewish history in Hungary, <laughs> uh, but I would uh, like to highlight the last 100, 150 years when my great-grandparents, grandparents, and my parents lived through from 1960. Uh, 80, 1867 to 1914, the beginning of the First World War, that era is called the Golden Age of Hungarian Jewelry because um, the first time in history um, Hungarian Jews were emancipated. They uh, gained full citizenship in Hungary. They uh, can they were able to go to higher education institutions. They were, uh, they became leaders of uh, the industries. Uh, many of the famous Hungarian writers and uh, composers uh, were Jewish. So Jewish life in Hungary strived until uh, 1914 when First World War started. Hungary has unfortunately uh, throughout history was on the losing side uh, of the war and um, after the war and uh, the Versailles Treaty which uh, redraw the borders of uh, Europe uh, the Hungarian um, territory was uh, uh, significantly uh, narrowed down about 35% of the Hungarian territories were given to the neighboring countries, Romania, Yugoslavia, uh, Soviet Union. And also about 35-36% per, uh, of uh, the Hungarian speaking population became citizens of other countries. This uh, resulted in a such a tremendous bitterness in Hungary. And unfortunately, uh, following the war, just one year after the war ended, there was a communist revolution in Hungary, which lasted only three months. But most of the communist leaders were Jewish. So the Hungarian population equated 
communism with uh, Jews, and that resulted in uh, a serious restriction uh, on Jewish life. The first uh, anti-Jewish laws in Europe were enacted in 1920, the so-called numerous clauses uh, law, which restricted the students in higher education uh, institution to 5% um, the Jewish uh, participation uh, in college and university life. This was the background uh, of uh, the time when my parents were born, um, both of them in 1907. Uh, my father family, he came from a conservative Jewish family. They were observant, but not very much so. My mom came from a very orthodox uh, family. Uh, my great-grandfather was a rabbi. And um, they um, got married in 1937, 1939. Um, Second World War started, 1940. My father was conscripted to the forced mm -hmm. uh, labor battalion and the rest of uh, is the story which we are about to A, co uh, a couple discover. more questions about that time prior to the war. Because of those numerous clauses laws, your father was directly affected by that in terms of his career choices. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, after high school, my father wanted to be like a good Jewish boy, a lawyer. <laughs> and uh, at that time, uh, the Hungarian education system was a little bit different uh, from what we have here and what they have now in Hungary. After high school, you went to a specialized university. If you went, wanted to be a lawyer, you went to a university specialized for uh, engineers. And law, law school started after uh, high school uh, also. My father applied. Uh, he was rejected. And the rejection, the reason for the rejection uh, was that uh, they had a quota of the 5% and he didn't make the mm -hmm. top 5% of the Jewish applicants. The applicants uh, in, uh, for law school were about 40% of the people applied were Jewish. And um, unfortunately, for him, uh, he couldn't continue his studies. Um, he became a clerk at a publishing uh, mm -hmm. company. And your mother started her own business, right? She started her own business. Uh, she, according to uh, what she told me, she never wanted to uh, go to college. Uh, she was very um, good with her hands, and she became a um, uh, hat maker uh, for ladies, and in the 20s and 30s, uh, hats were a big deal, and she made a good uh, uh, living, and mm -hmm. actually, I think probably she earned more than my father did. And Peter, you, you, you said to me that up until the start of the war, your family really had a normal life. I mean, it was just a normal life. They did all kinds of things. They interacted with their non-Jewish friends and neighbors. Tell us a little bit about that. They kayaked, they... Yeah, that's correct. Uh, until uh, the war started in, um, again, 1940, uh, 1939, and Hungary entered into Second World War only 1941, life was relatively normal. There were anti-Jewish laws already from 1938 to 1941. They enacted at least three anti-Jewish laws, very similar to the Nuremberg uh, laws. These laws restricted uh, Jewish participation in um, uh, government jobs. First, uh, they just uh, set a quota. Next, uh, law said uh, no Jewish person can work for the government or public sector. Mm -hmm. They restricted their numbers um, in various uh, professions, like the number of uh, law 
lions, uh, licenses or doctor's licenses were restricted only 5% because 5% was not a magic number. It was approximately the proportion of the Jewish population within the great Hungarian uh, population. Later on, um, the anti-Jewish law declared Jews as a race, just like uh, in Germany. Jews are not a race, it's a religion or an ethnic group. Nevertheless, uh, this was, had a great effect on many people's life. Um, Hungarian Jews were, especially uh, in cities, very assimilated. Uh, many of them um, went to a uh, synagogue maybe once or twice a year. Many of them converted to Christianity. They weren't forced. They just wanted to be like everybody else. So when this uh, racial law was enacted, uh, everybody who had at least one Jewish grandparent were, uh, was uh, declared uh, Jewish. So it didn't matter that grandparents converted to Christianity, parents were born into a church and baptized. Uh, the person, uh, again, the third generation, uh, they were born into a uh, church and baptized. It did not matter. They uh, became uh, part of the Jewish community and unfortunately, or the discriminatory laws mm -hmm. apply to all this person. Peter, in, in a year, a little more than after the year began in October 1940, that's when your father was conscripted into a forced labor battalion. Tell us what you know about that and what it meant for you and your family. Well, I was born in 1941, so by the end of the war, um, I was only 40 years old. I have many, not so many, but uh, uh, quite a few personal memories. Um, Everything you hear today is uh, coming from uh, my mom's diary. Uh, she had uh, three of uh, uh, this kind of uh, notebooks, and she put her thoughts uh, during the war, especially after my father was taken to the forced labor camp. Her purpose was not really writing a diary. She wanted to preserve her memory to tell my father everything what happened in our life, especially uh, in my early formative years. So her hope was that my father would come back and she would able to refresh mm. her memory. Also, um, she preserved all the uh, postcards which my father uh, sent uh, from the forced labor camps, and those are the thoughts of my father between my birth and um, until she sent her uh, last postcard uh, before um, he perished. So from these sources, uh, what I can reconstruct is that um, we had a relatively normal life in uh, late 1940. My father was taken away. I was born in March 1941. Uh, my father was released from uh, the camp uh, for a week, I believe, or uh, two weeks. That uh, was the time when the picture was taken of the whole family. That was the last time he saw me. And um, from there on, uh, what we know about uh, my father, that uh, his battalion uh, was uh, taken to Ukraine when um, Nazi Germany invaded uh, in 1941 uh, Soviet Union, uh, the Hungarian troops went in. One reason was because they wanted to get back all the territories which were taken away from the Hungarians after the First World War. And that's uh, where uh, my uh, father perished uh, among the uh, 40,000 Hungarian Jews um, who uh, died in forced labor camps. 
and, and your mother during that time, even though she got the postcard, she didn't know where he was because of the censors? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, these uh, postcards had uh, no place of origin because that was uh, military right. secret. Right. So what we know, only the number the, of the battalion he served with. And uh, we do know from the official uh, document the Hungarian uh, Department of Defense sent to my mom in 1943 that he was uh, declared uh, a missing person in 1943 because the last time they knew about my father was January uh, of 1943 and that time his battalion was in Ostrogorsk, uh, Ukraine. It's about the mid uh, section of Ukraine. So with your father gone and, and then of course your mother learning later that he had perished there, um, it's, now your mother's caring for a very, very young infant boy. Um, how did she make, at that point, how did she make ends meet? What were you, what was she able to do to keep you, keep you going as a family during that time? One um, interesting thing to, we have to mention here that um, Hungary was not occupied by Nazi Germany until 1944. Therefore, what happened to the Jewish people uh, during uh, the Holocaust area, most of the things which happened happened because the Hungarian government brought all those anti-Jewish laws and they were the one who persecuted the Jews. It wasn't Nazi Germany. Hungarian Jews were not sent to the Nazi killing camps like Auschwitz and uh, others, um, Dachau, until 1944 when the Germans came in. But the Hungarians took care of their own Jews and their treatment uh, wasn't uh, very... Um, nice. Uh, we lived a relatively normal life uh, in Budapest. My mom worked. Uh, women still wore uh, uh, hats. Uh, we uh, had the money for the apartment. She even had enough money to hire a maid while she was working. Uh, this maid uh, took care of me. This one has changed also because 1943 there was another uh, law which uh, prohibited non-Jews working for Jews. Mm -hmm. My mom gave a good job to a, a young 19 years old uh, country girl uh, who took care of me. She was devastated because she lost uh, her job. My mom was devastated because she had to juggle her uh, work and taking care of me. So I actually um, grew up in a, a hat maker shop mm -hmm. uh, at least the first few years. Other aspects of life, again, um, because um, my mom was so protective and she took so care of me that I really don't know what was going on at in the real world. Uh, I don't remember of being hungry or thirsty mm -hmm. or not having a, a, a nice dress because my mom did everything she could to shelter me and um, she did um, a good job. Mm -hmm. I uh, can say that um, this one changed in 1940 for when we had to leave our apartment and we had to move to the well, let's 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 talk about that then now so after from really from 19 the beginning of the war until March 1944 as difficult as things were and of course you lost your father during that time things turned profoundly worse when the Nazis occupied Hungary in March of 1944 tell us why that happened uh, and then what that meant for you your mother and your community it happened uh, for at least two major reasons. Number one, uh, the Germans were defeated uh, in the Soviet Union and the Russian uh, Red Army. 
push the Germans back uh, all the way to Hungary. By 1944, the Russian troops entered to Hungary and the Germans uh, uh, were uh, fleeing from the Russians and so the occupation almost happened by an accident, but uh, actually it wasn't an accident because by that time the Hungarian government realized that the war was lost and they wanted to get out and they started secret negotiations, uh, first with the Allies, but uh, the French, American and, and the British uh, governments. They said uh, Hungary is being occupied or will be occupied or liberated by the Russians. You have to uh, negotiate with uh, the Soviet Union. Reluctantly, they started. The Germans learned about it. They, uh, uh, when they moved, 19, uh, moved into Hungary, 1944, March 19, they forced the, the governor of uh, Hungary to appoint a Nazi-friendly government, and that changed everything. Adolf Eichmann came with uh, 600 uh, uh, German ANZUS uh, troops uh, into Hungary, and they started uh, to deport the Hungarian Jews to the uh, infamous concentration and killing camps. First, they did the countryside within three months, about 400,000 Hungarian Jews out of the 800,000. Those of mostly who lived in the countryside were shipped to mostly uh, Auschwitz, uh, Birkenau, Bergen-Belsen, mm -hmm. and other concentration camps. By the summer so of 450,000 within a matter of weeks were deported, right? That's correct. Right. And um, again, we have to stop a little bit here because um, the Hungarian government up until now does, did not or haven't uh, recognized and uh, acknowledged uh, the Hungarian invol involvement of the, uh, the Holocaust. They say well, until 1944, Hungarian Jews were not deported deportation started in 44 after the Germans came in, so we have to blame them. Unfortunately, that's not true because it was the Hungarian police who rounded up the Jews and moved them to first to ghettos, then they moved them to the railway station, put them on uh, freight cars and shipped them uh, to the concentration And, and once that began in March 19th, 1944. You were immediately pretty much forced right out of your home. But your mom began making a series of decisions. Um, tell us what your mom did and where, where you would go um, in the, in the, because of the decisions that she was making. Yes. Uh, after the German occupation, the anti-Jewish laws became Slicker and slicker. In 44 April, we had to put on the yellow uh, David star. In uh, the summer of uh, 1944, they forced the Jewish population to move out from their uh, apartments and to move into so-called designated houses. Those houses were uh, marked with a yellow David star also. The non-Jewish population moved out from those apartment buildings and Jewish families moved in. Uh, sometimes two, three families uh, sharing a two-bedroom apartment. When we had to uh, move out from our apartment, uh, my mom realized that um, it wouldn't be a good idea to move where Jews are already concentrated because she either knew or just perceived that once the Jews are collected at certain places, it would be very easy to move them to another place, which uh, would be a concentration camp. So she decided not to move into uh, any of these designated houses, but uh, she had um, 
uh, a few, uh, actually quite a few, non-Jewish friends, and one of uh, them offered that uh, we can go to her apartment. So for a very short time, for a few weeks, we were staying uh, with this uh, non-Jewish family. Actually, I can say it was a Christian family because I do know they had a big cross on the wall and Jesus mm -hmm. picture. Um, so I assumed that they were Christians. And, um, and that's where we were until a good neighbor, uh, in quotation mark, reported us to the police that we were hiding there. Mm -hmm. And the next day, uh, two policemen uh, showed up uh, at our door. I remember that moment my, when my mom was arrested because we were sitting at the breakfast table. I was really tiny. They didn't have child seats, so I was sitting on two or three phone books or other uh, uh, thick volumes. And um, they came, uh, they took my mom away. I didn't know uh, what happened. The host family uh, explained, uh, or at least they tried to put me at ease, that, oh, it's nothing, they're just going to ask a few questions. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that most of the people who were arrested and were taken to that jail, it was an infamous uh, jail in Budapest, the so-called Moshonyi Street uh, Jail, where she was taken, that um, very few people uh, left alive. My mom, because of her uh, bravery and because of um, her uh, natural smartness, uh, she was able uh, to get out of uh, the jail by using the very document the Hungarian government sent her to tell her that my father died. My mom took that paper with her and she claimed to the jail warden that she was a war widow. War widows had a very special uh, treatment in Hungary during the war when there was rationing. They got a little bit mm -hmm. more food, uh, better treatment at uh, certain places. Unfortunately, well, my father wasn't part of the official Hungarian army, so my mom was not a war widow, only just uh, regular soldiers' widows were uh, uh, war widows. But fortunately for her and for me, when she showed that paper uh, with the signature of the defense minister, minister of uh, the Hungarian uh, army and a big stamp on it, uh, they believed that that's an official document that my mom was a war widow <laughs> and they panicked that they made a, a big mistake, so next day they let her go. Yeah. And, and of course, you can't go back to the home you're in now, and that's when you said your mother did another um, uh, major act of chutzpah at that point. Tell us, tell us what she did then. Uh, the chutzpah is the best word. That's a Yiddish word for being uh, uh, brave, but it's, uh, it's uh, brave beyond... Uh, what you would uh, do uh, using your natural senses. <laughs> uh, because we were reported in the police that we were hiding and the next uh, place we should have gone according to government regulation was the Budapest ghetto. And again, my mom by all means wanted to avoid to uh, go to the ghetto so she went to uh, visit another Jewish friend of hers who lived in a so-called protected houses. In 1944, a Swedish diplomat, Raul Wallenberg, uh, came to Budapest, uh, sent by the American War Refugee Board and financed by uh, the American government to save as many Hungarian Jews as possible. Uh, he did two major things. Number one, he gave false Swedish documents to many Hungarian uh, Jews, uh, so-called Schutz passes, 
And the other was that he bought up 32 apartment buildings in Budapest. And once uh, he bought them, they became the property of the Swedish government. And according to international law, the Hungarian government had uh, no control over those houses. So the Jews who moved into those houses were protected at least for a while uh, from being deported uh, to uh, the concentration camp. So my mom went to visit one of her Jewish friends in one of these protected houses. Uh, she decided on the spot that um, she's going to stay. Uh, we weren't officially invited into that house, but my mom said, uh, sorry, we're going to stay here. <laughs> and uh, it caused uh, some tension, my mom told later, because, again, there was actually a three-bedroom apartment, but there were already three families in it. And um, we uh, stayed in the, the living room and uh, um, until we had to move again. And Peter, um, during that time, of course, the Allies were bombing uh, Budapest and the war was really being concentrated where you were. The deportations ended for a while in, um, in July or August of the summer, but resumed again in October 1944. And then things really got incredibly um, more frightening for you at that point because your mother had been in this protected house with you. That would all that would all change. Yeah, and there was another factor in October '94. A far right uh, Nazi party took over the Hungarian government again, with the protection and uh, and encouragement uh, of uh, Nazi Germany, and this. Uh, far-right Nazi party was called the Arrow Cross. Uh, they uh, had a military unit uh, uh, and these uh, uh, personnel first surrounded all these protected ha houses and they didn't let people in and out. And in October when the Nazis took over the Hungarian government they didn't care about international laws. They went to these houses. They rounded up all the Jews. And again, my uh, mother prediction that once the Jews are in one place, they could be very easy targets uh, became a reality. And um, one by one, families were removed from our apartment buildings. And when it was our turn uh, to move, and many of these people didn't even uh, get to the railway station and they weren't even deported to Germany. Many of them were led to the, uh, the shore of the Danube and they were uh, just shot uh, there uh, into the river. The river washed away uh, their uh, bodies. Um, today there is a very touching document in Budapest uh, along the Danube uh, with um, uh, empty bronze shoes uh, remembering the people who had to uh, take off their clothes and, and, and shoes before they were shot into the river. When it was our turn um, and the uh, Hungarian Nazi military uh, uh, personnel came into our apartment building, um, it was either a divine uh, coincidence or, again, um, very hard to explain how we escaped from being deported or taken to the Danube. Previously, we uh, little boys uh, were playing uh, in the inner courtyard of these apartment buildings, uh, the way they are built in Budapest, that. Uh, Every apartment building has an inner court where uh, there was uh, a, even a playground. Uh, mm -hmm. At least we played there as far as I know. And of course, these uh, Hungarian Nazis uh, were there with their uh, weapons protecting us, actually protecting that we wouldn't escape. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, made fun of us by 
uh, we were being boys. Uh, we were uh, pretending that uh, the handle of a broom was a rifle and we were shooting each other. And these uh, Nazi thugs uh, said uh, it would be uh, more entertaining if we would use their weapons. Fortunately, they removed the ammunition. But here we were, a little Jewish boys with uh, yellow stars on our uh, uh, clothes and uh, pretending uh, shooting each other, not knowing that in the outside world, uh, uh, Jewish people with yellow star were uh, shot with uh, real uh, rifles. Going back uh, uh, to the event, uh, what happened in the apartment when we were rounded up, these Nazi thugs came in and one of uh, these young guys, um, they were 16, 17 years old because everybody over 18 was already uh, conscripted in the Hungarian army. Uh, we became friends according to what my mom told me later uh, while we were playing uh, um, in the courtyard. And this guy uh, just had mercy on uh, me and uh, he told to his uh, uh, colleagues that uh, leave this family alone. I know little Peter and he's a good guy. Uh, let uh, them leave uh, or stay here. As soon as they uh, left the apartment. Because they were gonna go to the next apartment and take the next family. Exactly, yeah. that's what happened. Um, my mom realized that we cannot stay uh, even uh, one more day. Uh, we left this protected houses and finally in October we moved into the Budapest ghetto. So, so now you're in the Budapest ghetto and you know, still many thousands of Jews concentrated there. This is of course later, late in the war for Hungary. Budapest soon comes under siege from the Russians and the Allies. And there you are in this living in this very, very, very compacted uh, part of Budapest. What will tell us about that? A little bit of the ghetto. It was set up at the traditional Jewish quarter of Budapest around the great uh, synagogue uh, of uh, Budapest. It was walled, uh, nobody in, nobody out. Um, by that time, the Allied uh, and uh, uh, troops and air forces regularly bombed Budapest. Uh, we spent most of the time in bomb shelters. Um, food uh, was rationed, but even we couldn't get uh, our rationed food because uh, food was short supply. Water, uh, sometimes we had water, sometimes we didn't. Electricity was out most of the time. Uh, that's uh, uh, where we spent most of our uh, days in the uh, bomb shelter. Uh, as far as I can remember, again, I don't know where my mom got any food, but I don't remember being hungry or thirsty. And uh, again, my mom came from a very orthodox uh, Jewish family. We had to... Uh, keep uh, the Jewish dietary laws so we couldn't eat anything made out of uh, pork. But that laws were not obeyed during these circumstances. Actually, I think in Jewish laws, there is an exception when you save life, you can uh, uh, break the law. So when my grandmother um, found a piece of bacon somewhere, um, we gladly ate it. You said your diet, to a large extent, was um, potato skins. Uh, yeah, that's another uh, thing. Uh, in this country, uh, potato skin, I wouldn't say uh, delicacy, but it's a regular fare. In Hungary that time, and I think until now, you gave it to the pigs that was uh, uh, not eaten. But during the war, we ate anything and everything which was edible and potato skin was uh, uh, one of the things uh, we survived on. And as, as you'd explained to me, the water source became, if you could get water out of hydrants on the street, but if you go outside, 
there's everything from snipers and bombing, and I mean, you're, you're, you're in the midst of warfare there, and, and, and the conditions are really terrible. And on top of that, it was that winter of 1944 into 1945 was an especially harsh winter. So things are frozen. Yes, uh, that's correct. And um, again, um, with hindsight, I, I just don't know how people could survive. And unfortunately, many people did not survive. Many of the victims uh, of the Holocaust did not uh, die in concentration camp. They died of starvation, not getting medical uh, attend attention, not uh, having access to medications, and uh, people uh, were dying uh, really left and uh, right. Uh, my grandparents, they survived uh, the, uh, the war, the Holocaust, but a couple of months later they died because uh, uh, they were so weak that uh, a common cold took right. them. Tell us about being liberated. What do you remember about that? About the liberation, um, very briefly, um, the Soviet army uh, came into the Budapest ghetto in January 18, uh, 1945. Um, we were liberated. Um, The word liberation uh, means different things to different people. And um, I stop here just for a second because one um, lesson uh, we learned from the history that uh, what happened during the Holocaust, depending on uh, uh, the political situation, can be explained one way or the other. Uh, there is no explaining a way that the Soviet troops uh, liberated Hungary from Nazi occupation. Today, historians, Hungarian historians, say that uh, one occupation were, was replaced with another occupation. That's true in certain sense. Uh, uh, Allied troops uh, occupied Germany, Austria, mm -hmm. uh, France, and uh, for a limited time, uh, they were the so-called occupation forces. But for us Jews, that was a liberation. It was a liberation because we were not threatened by taking us to concentration camps or uh, killing us on the street of, uh, of Budapest. I, Remember the first Soviet soldiers who came in and um, they gave us uh, candies. Other people have memories. Uh, uh, Soviet troops came in and they raped their daughters. Um, it happened also. So um, again, uh, depending on what side of uh, history you stand, you explain certain events. Um, so once the Soviets are in, you you can literally emerge from your hiding places in the cellars and the ghetto into a devastated city. What what did your mom do then? Well, we went back to our original apartment. Our apartment uh, was given to an ethnic German uh, family, who happened to uh, be many of the ethnic Germans uh, joined the Nazis when they uh, came into Hungary. This family was a very friendly uh, family. They preserved our apartment. We left our apartment with one suitcase and a um, handbag, and everything else uh, was left, and everything was intact. And when we came back, they said, we're going to go to our next place. We went back uh, to our apartment. Uh, my mom tried to pick up uh, where we left. Unfortunately, there was no demand for um, for hats anymore. Uh, people was happy to uh, have uh, what they already had. They definitely didn't order custom-made ones. Mm -hmm. So she started uh, to work as a seamstress. Also, we. Uh, had no income in order to buy uh, the 
very limited supply of uh, groceries and everything you needed, money. The inflation in Hungary in 1946 was horrible, uh, dozen percent per hour. The last time they didn't have enough on uh, room on the banknotes for the zeros because uh, the inflation was uh, just such a thing. Anyway, what people did at that time, that whatever they could save during the Holocaust uh, valuables, they went to the countryside and they bartered uh, for, um, for food. So whatever family jewelry uh, we had or whatever uh, was valuable, my mom took it took the train, mm -hmm. we went to the countryside, um, we came back with some food, and um, uh, slowly uh, life returned to normal, if you can call normal, there were no more air raids, there were uh, still bodies on the street, uh, people uh, ate, um, that time, we don't, didn't have a lot of automobiles, so uh, goods were uh, 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 carried uh, with horse-drawn carts, and many of those horses became victims of the bombing, and mm -hmm. there were uh, those carcasses uh, lying on the street, and people just carved as much as uh, they could, and, and uh, cooked it and, and ate it. Um, Anyway, uh, it's a long story from there until 1980 when I defected. <laughs> it's a very, <laughs> and, and uh, with many time. major <laughs> events, with many major events for you. Um, your, your, your mother did try to get out of Hungary um, fairly early um, after the war and, and was unable to for a good while. Tell us, tell us why that, well, in fact, she wasn't. Tell us, tell us about those attempts. Uh, my mom had eight siblings, and uh, two of them were lucky enough to get out of Hungary before the war started. An aunt and uncle of mine uh, uh, came to the United States in 1938 and 1941, and they lived in Baltimore, and after the war, they. Uh, wanted us uh, to join us. Uh, we applied for a Hungarian passport. You saw the pa passport pictures. And uh, we uh, applied for entry visa to the United States. Unfortunately, that time, and if uh, you visited the permanent exhibition, you heard a little bit about it or saw that there was a very strict Quota. There were just a very limited number of emigrants, especially Jewish emigrants, allowed to come to the United States. So we had to wait in line until our turn. Our turn didn't come until 1949, when the Hungarian government uh, closed the, the borders. And even if our number came up, nobody in, nobody out in Hungary again. And so I grew up in the communist system. In 1956, uh, there was a revolution, lasted only 10 days. The borders were open uh, for a very limited time. 200,000 Hungarians uh, left Hungary that time. I and my family wasn't uh, among them. My mom remarried in 1953. My stepfather was a Holocaust survivor. The very few who survived um, uh, Auschwitz, um, he had the number on his arm. And uh, just one thing to mention, if we had time, that unfortunately, Holocaust history was not taught in Hungary when I grew up. Um, Hungarians had good reason why they uh, didn't uh, want to talk about it. And unfortunately, the survivors uh, didn't talk about it either because of the experience uh, they went through. So um, I saw the number of, uh, on my uh, stepfather's arm. I asked him what it was, and he said, oh, it's nothing. And um, he died without ever telling uh, us, uh, to me and my stepbrother, uh, his story, how he survived uh, Auschwitz. 
Peter, um, in just the, the little bit of time we have left, a couple of questions. Uh, from what you've told us about your mom, it's, it's evident uh, you, you, you referred to her smartness. She was incredibly brave, resourceful. After the war, how did she do? Well, she worked hard. Again, uh, she was uh, good with her ha hands. Um, she um, uh, worked as a seamstress uh, for a while on her own. Then all the private enterprises were uh, taken over by the government. She was forced to uh, work in a, I think it's cooperative, uh, what it was called mm -hmm. that time. Um, she made uh, female dresses uh, for um, the rest of her years until she retired. She worked hard in two shifts, uh, six to two or two to uh, uh, ten in the evening. And um, she made enough money that we had food on the mm -hmm. table and clothes to wear. And um, again... Um, Because of, let me jump ahead a little bit, because you're, you'd had two relatives get to the United States in, I think, 1980 or so, you came to visit, uh, you came to visit them, and that's when you made the decision to, to defect and stay put, right? Yeah, that's the end of the story. Um, I was naive uh, uh, for a while, and because I didn't know anything better, I thought that life it is what it is, what we experienced uh, in Hungary. I was able uh, to go to university. Uh, tuition was practically nil. Uh, I got a good education. I got a good job. I went to concert and theater. So I, I had a relatively good life. However, after a while, you realize that uh, good life is not about food or going skiing or, uh, or to a concert. And you realize how oppressive uh, the communist system was. And because of my job, I was able to uh, travel to Western Europe, which was a tremendous privilege. Uh, we were not allowed to uh, uh, go to Western Europe. So when I personally saw that what we were told, the dying capitalism was not really dying, but it was thriving. I realized that, uh, that we are really brainwashed and uh, the relative comfort we had in Hungary really did not satisfy me because of many reasons. Number one, everything was good. Uh, controlled by the government, all the media, uh, what we see, uh, what we saw on television or theaters were approved by the Hungarian government. So we didn't get any modern uh, uh, thing which came from the West. And um, that was uh, very frightening. And also, uh, although we didn't touch on my spiritual uh, evolvement, uh, because of the war my, and the circumstances, I didn't get a Jewish education. I became later interested in Judaism on my own. I became um, aware of uh, what Israel was and what Israel was not. The Israel I read about uh, in the newspapers or saw uh, uh, mm -hmm. on the television, and all this propaganda became just unbearable at one mm -hmm. time, and I said, enough is enough, and in 1980, I came to the United States, and um, I never went back. I still have the plane ticket uh, mm -hmm. from uh, <laughs> JFK uh, to Prague to Budapest, and uh, one day maybe I'm going to frame it. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We we're, we're out of time, and, and, and we've, unfortunately, I think you, you know that we've had to make this a very short session. There's so much that we, uh, both during the war and certainly after the war, that we're not hearing from Peter, and we're out of time to ask a few questions. But when Peter, he, it's our tradition that the first person gets the last word. And so when Peter finishes, I have two requests of you. One is 
We're going to ask you to stand when he finishes because Joel, our photographer, is going to come up on stage and take a photograph of Peter with you as the background. Um, but also, um, Peter's going to stay behind for a while, so that's an opportunity to please come up here, ask him any question you want to ask him, you know, get your picture taken with him or just say hi, whatever you would like to do when, when we're done. And um, we'd also um, uh, like to remind you that we do first-person programs each Wednesday and Thursday through the middle of August. The website will have information about the program in 2017, so we hope you can return. I want to thank you for being with us. I want, before Peter gives us his last word, I want to say thank you for being willing to share this with us. And I wish we'd had you know, three or four more hours to spend with you, but we'll, yes. we'll, we'll take our hour. <laughs> I wanted to read a couple of my uh, can, can excerpts. I, can I interrupt for just a second? Sure. It, when you come up here, if, if you can just glance with Peter at um, the postcards from his father, they're, 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 they're astonishing. He tries on one little page, he tries to write so tiny to cover every inch of it. And, and just tell us, be sure you tell us how your father addressed your mother in those. Uh, the squirrel? Uh, yeah, that's a Hungarian yeah. <laughs> term of endearment. Uh, a little squirrel, my little squirrel. That, that was my mom. And um, anyway, uh, maybe another occasion we will have uh, time to go into those details or maybe one day when I finish translating into English and uh, I put on uh, a blog or the museum website, uh, you have uh, a chance to uh, see for yourself. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming and thank you for uh, uh, participating uh, in this program. I believe this is a very uh, important uh, program Although the Holocaust uh, is a unique event in history, uh, the consequences are universal. And this museum is all about uh, the history of the Holocaust for the purpose that it will never happen again. And that's the motto of the museum, uh, never again. But there is another sentence there, uh, what you do matters. And so for me, doing these first person conversations and uh, talking to students and, and other groups, um, the major purpose is that, uh, that uh, we are getting older. Um, I may not look 75, but I am 75. And I am the youngest of the survivor volunteer group uh, most of the people in their early or late 80s. So we don't know how much longer we can give our personal testimony and make sure it never happens. So that second sentence in the motto, what you do matters, it's you in the audience, you the visitors of uh, these museums and people in school to make sure that this history will be preserved, uh, interpreted in the right way. And that's very important because Holocaust denial is alive and well, and especially with the internet, uh, uh, their audiences are just uh, really endless. So um, I just want to encourage you, what you heard here today, what you experience in the museum, what you can find on the internet, use it. Use it every time when you see discrimination. Really, discrimination is one thing how the Holocaust started, that there were discrimination against not the Jews, interestingly enough, but communists and trade unionists, and then the Jews, and we know what discrimination might lead to. And unfortunately, um, genocide has happened since uh, the end of Second World War. Uh, millions died uh, in Cambodia and Darfur and other places where ethnic and religious animosity is just uh, overboiling and, and um, what 
we can do is to raise our voices every time when we see bullying or see uh, discrimination and, uh, and be aware of propaganda. Uh, there are, and again, with the internet and 890 channels on television, <laughs> propaganda is all over the place. And again, Nazi propaganda was instrumental in the um, annihilation of uh, uh, six million Jews. I think uh, that's all I wanted to say. And all we have time for. <laughs>